Your music, your station, Carrick Fergus FM. And at this point, joining me on the line, Miss Carolyn Stewart. Carolyn, how are you? I'm very good. Extra good. Lovely to talk to you, Michael. Lovely to talk to you as well. How are you keeping? I'm keeping all right. You know, not bad, not bad. I'm getting myself excited as we get towards the big event. Um, so looking forward to um, Christmas like everybody else and, and just in good form, yeah. Uh, you can't not be in good form in the run-up to Christmas. That's what I think as well. You see, now you're well known for being uh, fantastic at decorating things. Have you got the U105 studio looking uh, all prim and proper yet? Of course. You know, I mean, rule number one, get your get your festive gear on and get the place decorated. <laughs> of course, you got to bring a wee bit of brightness, a wee bit of sunshine to um, the studio around Christmas time. Now, I know David Johnson gives you a hard time for doing the decorations, but I'll let you into a secret. David Johnson helped me do the decorations here in Carrick Fergus. Oh, did he indeed? And they're not yeah. looking bad. So next time he gives yeah. you grief, just remind him of that, okay? <laughs> I'll make sure I do give him grief. He's a closet Christmas decorator there. <laughs> he right. is indeed. <laughs> now, I was looking at this earlier. Is it correct that you've been working in radio for around 22 years now? I'm not trying to age you now, so if I'm wrong, you can tell me. You are trying to age me. Um, yes, that is absolutely right. It's and unbelievable. I remember every single minute of every single show. So <laughs> it's, it's been a long time, but it's been great. It's great fun. How did it all start off for you, if you can take us back? How did it start off for me? Well, Michael, I mean, I go back to the early 80s, remember I was DJing in clubs, and um, I actually had DJed in loads of clubs around Belfast, and I had decided to put myself forward for the DJ of the Year um, oh, championships, and it was just a load of um, local guys sort of got, getting up on one night in, in tracks in Port Rush and um, trying to get the biggest crowd and the biggest cheer and all of that. And I actually won that award um, back in the late 80s. And because I won it, what happened then was the DJ magazines around Europe, UK and Europe, picked up on this because it was unusual to have a female DJ. So it sort of, there was a bit of an interest in it. And um, I got the exposure and then I started to get some calls to go and and different clubs around the UK and Europe which which I did and in doing all of that then um, you know people get to know your name and uh, I was also working in a, a, a warehouse in Malus called Solomon in Paris which really distributed records to record shops right across Northern Ireland and what I would do whenever I did my gigs at night I would then bring in um, a, a recording like a cassette and listen to it during the day in my workplace in the warehouse whilst I was putting the records out and sorting out people's orders and at that time um, Jackie Favell and a lot of other um, old hands mm-hmm. were coming in to get their music for their gigs that they were doing. And he he came in one day and he heard the tape recorder playing and he said, is that you? And I said, yeah, I was doing a gig last night and just listening back to it to see if how I, I can improve it. And he said, you should send that into radio, that sounds really good. And I said, really, do you think so? Um, so that's exactly what I did. I sent it in to him. Um, he said he would hand it to the appropriate ears. And he did that. Um, and at that time, John Rossborough was was in charge of programming and uh, really what Jackie did was he handed it to John Rossborough. John Rossborough then got in touch with me and said, do you want to have a chat? And uh, I went down and, and we, we chatted and before I knew it, I had a gig on radio. So it, it basically happened like that. Being in the right place at the right time. It's yeah, fun. it's like a fairy tale story almost. It is kind of, it was, it was like a dream come true. But you know, to be honest, even whenever I was just doing the, I was doing the clubs, I was very happy doing that and I hadn't really thought about stopping doing that or I mean that, that to me was my first love was you know getting the music getting people on dance floors and you know radio came, kind of came secondary to that and um would that still be know, the case I, like I say it was just like being in the right place at the right time in order to move forward and, and do something different yeah, would you still say that for you it's the music that comes first whether it be radio or a club it's all about the music yeah it is I mean for me the music is my priority and that kind of changes, but for years, as you know, I, I did nighttime radio, and yep. I produced and presented the shows myself, you know, so I put together the music, I sourced the music, I, I, I did all of that, and on nighttime radio, you kind of get away with that, because there's a lot more freedom, you're not sort of like playlist, restricted to playlist, and um, that, that has kind of changed now with daytime radio, and I have to be honest, like I do find that kind of frustrating, because I, my big thing is finding music and using people to it. Yeah, and you you do it so well, and that's what people really know you for. And as well, I suppose, it takes yeah. a real dedication to your music to be able to find something new and fresh to bring it forward. It, it's just something that I've always, I've really enjoyed doing that from when I was kids. You know, whenever I used to go into the record shops, and people remember the old shops making tracks and Caroline Music and all those old record shops we used to have the, you know, the 50p bin. You know, I would be hooking in those, trying to find, <laughs> you know, with a little sort of pocket money that you had, trying to find 
you know, to you could invest your money in, and then bringing them home and finding the odd little gem, and then rushing to let other people hear it. So I've always actually been interested in letting people hear um, or introducing music to other people. I mean, it's, it's always been my thing, and I still really love doing that. You know, I bought a, a system recently for the house called the Sonos. I don't know. I've been raving about it to everybody, but basically, it lets you listen to anything. I mean, that's just like unlimited access to anything in the world from the 1950s to today and I have been even using that at home saying to people what do you hear this tune you know? <laughs> so I still do that even though I don't have as much freedom to choose the music now because the playlist is, is pretty much sure. sorted out for you during daytime radio so I don't really get a chance to do that to the masses but I still do it to all my friends and family Have you a, a favourite decade or a favourite track you just have to listen to? A favourite decade? Um well, I think my favourite year for music would have been the late 70s, I mm-hmm. guess, kind of 78, 79, um, kind of sticks out to me. Um, favourite tune, that's a very difficult one. Um, I can never answer that when people ask me it, but I always ask other people. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a difficult tune. I, I think maybe Ella Fitzgerald's version of Summertime might oh, be brilliant song. my favourite tune. Brilliant song. Have you? Did you watch any of The X Factor this time round? Yes, I did. What are your views on that? Um, did you enjoy it? Was it or not as much? Um, I, 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 to be honest, I have to say that this is the first time I actually watched X Factor with interest. I mean, oh. every other year I haven't watched it, and I don't know how I got. I probably watched it because I felt like I needed to know what was going on for my own radio show in order to be able to, to, to tap into what everybody else was doing. But I mean, I just find that the X Factor. It, I find it a bit tedious, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's not the sort of... I, I just don't feel that it's a good way to find talent and to put people into... Um, just to put them on that sort of huge platform and to see whether they sink or swim. I don't... It's almost like watching a car crash a lot of the time. It, it can really be like that. Do you know, just the moment that sort of made me think, oh gosh, that'll annoy some people, is when Talisa didn't recognise an Aretha Franklin song and I thought, oh, come on, they're the judges. Exactly. You know, and things like that where I just think, you are judging people on their music and now you're saying you've never heard of Rita Franklin's song, Think. I mean, seriously, how can you not have heard of that song? I mean, it, it just, it, it, it did, I mean, I, I did gasp, I have to be honest, whenever she she said that. And Louis said it as well. He said that he'd never heard of it as well. I'm like, are these two people judges or what? <laughs> um, so yes, it's hard to have a, a credibility in, in people whenever they don't know the classics yeah you know. um but no uh, to be honest i actually tapped in more to the american x factor did you see it it's, it's been really good the, yeah. the only thing that isn't better about their version is they don't have peter dixon well that's true that is true but i have to say that i thought the talent was much better in the american x factor i thought that every single one of the contestants come through could have went on to be a superstar and i think probably a, a few of them will um I didn't really particularly like the judges. I didn't like Nicole Scherzinger. I didn't like her style. Um, what about the wee girl crying? Did you see that one when she oh went I out? I did. Rachel, that was just like, well, that was car crash, wasn't it? It was horrible. This is wrong to see a kid break down like that on, on TV and our dreams all shattered right in front of you. Um, although I've been talking to a few people since that who think that maybe that was all staged, but I don't know how a 13-year-old could stage that, really. No, if, if she staged it, give her an Oscar. Yeah, she did. it was convincing. Yeah. I, it was sold to me. Uh, if it wasn't for radio, Carolyn, what would it have been for you then? You know, if it wasn't for radio and for gigging and working in music, which is your main passion, what would it have been? Is there anything else? Um, other things that I would be interested. In. I, I've got such a wide, varied inter- interest in life. I, I mean, I sometimes think about how lovely it would be to like open a dog sanctuary and just look after dogs. Um, I think about that quite often. I think about. Um, having a, a, like a garden centre I love gardening and I just think it would be such a lovely thing that's a bit of a pipe dream sort of you won the lottery you could potter about all day and let things grow and then sell them to people you know so I've thought about doing that over the years um, I, I went to Queen's and studied law because I thought maybe I might like to be a barrister um, and then I realised how hard that is to do and respect to every barrister that's out there doing it and making a living because it's, it's so difficult but um, I thought maybe at some point that I might have enjoyed doing that. And you know, sometimes I still think that I would enjoy standing up and presenting a case for somebody, you know. I reckon you could. because you. Well, I, I do enjoy I do enjoy that, and I'm, I'm always interested in, 
you know, high profile cases. I always seem to tap into it. I'm drawn to it. But, you know, I kind of, whenever I was studying law and I was watching how much, how difficult and how hard the work was, and I knew that that was just a taster, um, I thought, my goodness, how could I give up what I love doing? Um, you know, okay, you might make more money being a barrister, and, and what am I saying? You might, you would. You would make, make more, more money, money yeah. Being a barrister, <laughs> but I just love what I do so much that I, I just can't kind of find myself really grateful that I've got something that I love doing, that I can get up every morning and go, and go to work. And most people in the industry, you know, Michael, will actually say that, that you feel really privileged that you've got a job that you really love doing because you couldn't pretend to love broadcasting. You either do or you don't. No, and I think the listener always knows as well when you're enjoying yourself. Well, that's it. You know, it's like going to see a show. I mean, if you're watching somebody on stage and they're not really enjoying it or they're nervous or they're not really having a good time, you're on the edge of your seat with them and you're not really relaxing or enjoying it either. The same with radio. If you're listening and you know that somebody's having a good time on the radio, you'll just sit back and you'll enjoy that. You'll, you'll enjoy it with them. Where did the idea of the bistro and sort of the Saturday Night Fever as well, because I know the, the two shows that you do, where did that format, that idea come from? Because it's it's different. You know, everyone wants their, their listeners to be a part of their show, but you literally invite them into this space where they can come and they can party with you. Well, the first first of all, you know, the whole idea of the Saturday Night Fever, um, whenever I, I, I used to work clubs on a Saturday night, uh, I wasn't on the radio, and I used to be going from A to B, um, and it was every radio station I tapped into, it was heavy dance music, like really heavy, heavy club music. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing really that you could listen to that put you in party mood. And I used to find myself flicking through all the channels to see if I could find something. And I, I never could, so I ended up bringing CDs in the car whenever I was going to do my gigs. But then whenever I got the gig here and I, I was offered the Saturday night, I thought I would love to do that. And I would love to do a show that is just party music for people who are in our target audience, 40, 40 plus. Um, that they would just songs that they would remember from whenever they used to really club or go to parties or discos, and in that way, to be honest, I thought the best way of doing this is to let the show be listener driven, which is why Saturday Night Fever is so successful. I mean, the listeners take over from the minute the show starts. The listeners are involved in that show. They're involved with taking the tunes to picking the tunes. They're involved with t- telling us where they used to party and club, which everybody then taps into and starts reminiscing about where they used to party and club. So it's just really just trying to give people something great to listen to whilst they're getting ready to go out, whilst they're making the dinner, um, even if they're staying in and having a few friends around, and just thinking, what sort of soundtrack would they like, which will help them reminisce and just really have a good Saturday night. So that's why the listeners are so important. I mean, that show would not work without the listeners. They, they really, really do need to be a part of it, and they are. Um, so that's where the Saturday Night Fever and the, the whole idea of the disco came from, because we started then visualising, you know, let's say it is a disco. It's a disco on the radio. Let's say that, you know, you're going to the disco. Do you know, Michael, people actually used to come down to UTV thinking, where's the disco? <laughs> <laughs> I can well believe it. It was like when uh, Paul had Paul Boyd had to produce the spin the wheel because people were, they just had to see the wheel. They had to see that's it right. happen. That's right. And, you know, you make, the more you make people part of it, and people then call it their own, um, you know, I think the more successful it is. And the same with the bistro, you know, the idea of that came, it actually came from the Nightbirds thing that I had whenever I did the nighttime program, where, you know, we had like a Nightbirds nest. So everybody who was listening at night felt that they were part of like a social thing that was on the radio. And it was just real, that's basically what it was. I mean, that's the crudest way I can put it, where people actually thought this is like a, some sort of community centre, like a social club where they can tap in at night if they were on their own, they had a bit of company. And people actually at night started to get to know other listeners, which really is something else, you know, where you know other listeners were popping in and saying, hi, Carolyn, just checking in, just wondering, has Annette been in yet? You know, has Tracy been in yet? You know, you sort of got that sort of thing where it actually did sound like a club. And so whenever I was offered the daytime show, I thought, well, let me try and um, transfer that that I had at night to daytime. A lot of people thought, you can't do it, daytime is so different that you'll not be able to do it. Well, look, I've done it. I, I created a bistro where people actually do pop in for a coffee and a listen, you know, and that's exactly what makes it the bistro. And as well, the people who uh, listen to the bistro, very good at giving you gifts. Have you received any Christmas presents yet from them? <laughs> My listeners are very, very kind. I mean, well, we, you know, we've had food nonstop over yes. the last week or so here. Um, and I've just been told, just as you, that's really funny that you asked me that. <laughs> Frank Mitchell just passed by me just before I started chatting to you, and he said, have you bought hampers for your dogs? And I said, no. 
And he said, I said, why do you ask? And he said, well, seriously, have you ordered hampers? And I said, no. And he said, well, they're just, he said, if you haven't, you have a serious fan. And I said, why? And he said, I've just walked past reception and there are two huge dog puppy hampers. Wow. One for each dog in reception. So, so yeah, that's probably the, the, the best present I've received so far, if, if that is true. I haven't seen it yet, but Frank's just told me that it's there. You see, because even when, um, the, the one time Ivan and I actually sat in one of your shows that you weren't able to do, and it was just bombarded with, where's Carolyn? Where is she? We've stuff we want to send in to her. And there were people phoning, just in, going, we need to send this to Carolyn. Why are you here? You know, when, and Ivan... You just pretend. You should have just put on a wee bit of a high-pitched voice, or probably a deeper voice. Um, <laughs> I would have <laughs> done you a disservice. Just to get the good <laughs> Carolyn, <laughs> is... get fish suppers, because I normally get those on a Saturday. <laughs> you see if Frank's still there, by the way, will you uh, gloat to him that Man City finally lost? I'm sure everyone already has, but... You know what? He handles the he handles it all right. You know what? No matter what, I hear people slagging him off all the time. Yeah. And he always has a wee sort of quip. He, ha- he must have a couple of lines stashed away for whenever his team get hammered. <laughs> it's, do you know what it is? It's that Man City screensaver on his computer that just leaves it open for the likes of me and Chris Brennan and Colm and stuff just that's, to, that's to rip right. in. That's right. But, Carolyn, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks very much for your time. And no, it's lovely chatting to you, Michael. I'm um, a pleasure. And um, yeah, good luck with the show, and, and good luck with um, your future too. Absolutely. Well, I'll be talking to you soon, I'm sure. Anyway, so take care in the meantime. And if I don't see you beforehand, a very merry Christmas as well. And the same to you and yours, Michael. Happy Christmas to you. Happy Christmas. Bye now. Bye.